Hey, everybody. Welcome to Booked Solid, the podcast uh, for anyone with clients from Pocket Suite. I am your host, Hansa Bergwall, and we have a fantastic guest for you today. His name is uh, Michael Shikashio, CDBC. He is the founder of aggressivedog.com and focuses on teaching other professionals from around the world on how to successfully work with aggression cases. You may know him from the host of the popular podcast, The Bitey End of the Dog, or from being covered in major media like the New York Times, New York Post, Fox News, Baltimore Sun, Women's Health Magazine, Real Simple Magazine, Sirius XM Radio, and on and on. Uh, Mike Shikashio has also built a thriving dog business. He knows how to book clients. He trains other trainers. He's built a brand that is in demand around the world. And um, we're going to be talking about all of that. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and it's all right if I call you Mike. Absolutely. I appreciate that, Hansa. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to get jumping in a conversation. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I guess the first question I have is, how did your dog training career uh, begin? Yeah, so I could probably talk, since this is worth focusing a little bit on business and dog training, which is a great uh, blend of topics for me, is that I was um, I was working at a casino many years ago, of all things, to- so totally undog training related. Um, but I was fostering dogs, a lot of dogs that were, you know, from rescue and they needed a place to sort of like as a foster home. So I was doing a lot of that and, um, started, I wasn't really into dog training at the time. I just wanted to help these dogs more because one of the number one reasons for dogs to be surrendered or given up on to shelters and rescues is because of aggression issues or behavior issues. So, um, I, I kind of got more and more into that behavior and learning about it. And I always, always, I kind of always wanted to be a business owner as well, some sort of entrepreneur doing something on my own. So I was thinking like dog daycare at one time, but that shifted to, you know, I caught this behavior bug, as they say, where I was really interested in training and behavior to help these dogs. So I thought, what better way to be able to do something where I can have that business side and that entrepreneurial side, as well as kind of make a change in the world for the dogs and their people. Uh, and so it kind of blossomed from there. I started training, you know, all of the typical stuff. And then I kind of turned into just the aggression space that I'm in now. So It feels like an intimidating place to start with the aggression cases. Like uh, if you have a yeah. scary dog, you might not want to, you know, trust a newcomer to those kinds of cases. Or like, how did you how did you really begin and get, and get your first uh, clients? <laughs> Yeah, it can be, you know, it's, and I don't recommend it for everybody. It's, uh, you have to, there's a lot that goes into it where you have to have, um, sort of build up some, uh, self barriers, meaning, cause you're going to have dogs barking and lunging at you sometimes. And you're just there like, I'm just trying to help you. And they're telling you, you're not allowed here kind of, uh, behavior that's directed at you. But, um, yeah, you, you know, you kind of, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a passion of mine. You know, I know, I know that these dogs are mostly just they're hurting inside, you know, they're something in, as uh, traumatic has happened in their life or they're just being fearful of something. So once we understand that, then, you know, you, you look past all of that barking, snarling and lunging at you behavior that you sometimes see. Uh, and then the same thing with the people. I'm, I'm looking to help the, the owners because they're often confused and don't know which way to go. So it's uh, yeah, that's the rewarding aspect for me, for sure. Tell me about one of your hardest aggression cases and how you broke it down. Hmm. That's a good question. I get that question a lot and I, I've never, I'm never able to really narrow it down because when you think like, okay, difficult aggression case, so you're thinking like, you know, 200 pound large dog snarling and snapping at you. That's kind of what a lot of people think of like severe aggression. I definitely imagined snap. a chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe a chihuahua that's bitten somebody's arm off or something. Right. <laughs> so if we have, uh, if you're looking at severity, but usually it's the cop, the complexities in the people. Uh, and I know a lot of business owners are, you know, dealing with different types of clients all the time. And that's, that's the, the art of it is navigating those conversations because actually when you start getting down to working with the dogs, many of the cases are the same. You're just seeing the same thing over and over and over. It's the dynamic of the person you're talking to. That's going to be so different depending on the case. So your clients really, um, you're going to have difficult clients sometimes and as business owners, we have to navigate that, right? We have to know how to have conversations that are going to, um, you know, be fruitful, but also empathetic in understanding those clients' needs. So I think some of my most difficult cases have been like that. Um, if clients that are really struggling, um, really having a tough time, feeling very down, blaming themselves, and which then leads to 
they don't really feel motivated to do a lot of things, which then becomes an uh, issue for us because we're trying to make change for the dog, but the client's not necessarily doing it. And then we feel bad because maybe it's something we're doing. And then, then the client's like, you know, you have to kind of motivate that client. And you can't blame them because a lot of times they have valid reasons for not actually wanting to do things because maybe they're scared of taking their dog out because the dog has dragged them down to the ground or bitten somebody else. So uh, so those are my most complex cases is, is convincing the people and helping them uh, take the path forward with their dog. And I think that's universal, though, with any with any industry, yeah. right? You know. So let's talk about the talky or the sometimes snappy end of the client. Um, how do you deal with difficult clients, and do you have any examples? I think you have to, um, you know, obviously with all of our clients, we want to be professional, we want to be kind, we want to be empathetic, but we also have to set barriers for ourselves, you know, because self care is very important. We want to, we can't just, you know, grin and bear it as they say and take, you know, uh, all of the bad things our clients might say to us or about us. So um, I think that's how I first step into the the picture is just saying, okay, let's give this client a chance. So, um, you know, I think, I think your question was kind of like more specific like cases. Was that it? I yeah. Yeah. One. If you have yeah. a example, maybe no names of course, but yeah. Um, I have, uh, one client that has, um, I had one client, right. So that their, their dog was actually dangerous and the dog was, um, had bitten them very severely. So the owners, and, oh, wow. but they were not seeing this uh, potential danger and severity of it. Actually, one of the clients was sent to the hospital. I mean, with really like needed surgery because of the dog's bite injuries, but because they're so attached to their dog and they don't want to, uh, they would, they also don't want to be blamed for saying, Oh, it's your fault. And that's how they're feeling. Like it's, they feel like it's their fault or they feel like it's, and sometimes of course it can be, but most of the time it's not, it's just a misunderstanding of their dog. And so, uh, that was one of my do most difficult cases because I had to, you know, kind of convey to this client, this dog is actually dangerous. And, uh, they, probably, they didn't know after, even after being bitten. No, it, it's, a, that was, that was the most, why it was so difficult because I'm trying to convince them and they just weren't seeing that this actual dog could possibly kill you someday and you know you have to navigate that conversation very carefully because um there they they might not because you might be their only chance to kind of listen to was to it was it just like denial that. and they thought like yeah. oh he just yeah. like had a moment he's not really like that exactly and it's there was actually three separate attacks one of them was really bad two others were pretty bad but one was very bad and um you know, and I think it's again because we're, you know, our culture says, you know, we have to. It's it's never the dog's fault. Sometimes, sometimes it's the opposite, of course, in our culture. But a lot of times, we push this narrative of, um, you know, we have to save them all. We can't keep this. You know, you gotta. It's your fault. And so the client was feeling very guilty. Sort of right. had all of those, you know, ideas pushed on them. So they they weren't thinking of that at all. They're like, we can't be home. We can't return the dog to the rescue. We have to stick through this. You know. And I'm like, mm, maybe you don't, because this dog is dangerous. And I didn't really, you know, I didn't use those words at first, but it was just a, a but you had to eventually, eventually. Them? Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, just be know, like it, this was, dog could kill you. You need yeah, to take, I was, I was worried action. about their safety. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, well, I mean, but that's rare. I mean, that's rare. Those kind of cases are certainly not common. No, I've almost never met a dog that is aggressive at that level. Um, that's really that's really crazy. What do you think of that narrative as a dog trainer that um, deals with aggression cases? Because it is pretty prevalent in the space that it's it's the people, it's not the dog whenever there's, um, you know, no problems. And yet, you know, I have a dog and I love him to pieces and he's a very good dog, but he's definitely got a strong personality. Like, where do you where do you stand on that? That I'm, I'm, I'm very curious. I think it's just, um, you know, it's people have their own perspectives of, of, you know, cause it's a living sentient being, right? So mm -hmm. it's different than like, you know, if we're, we're talking about selling bikes or something, you know, so we're not necessarily worried about the emotions of another animal in that kind of, if that's our business. So I think it's when the emotions are involved, their own views, their own perspectives, you know, it's like any other topic that's out there, whether it's nutrition or the type of exercise you do or health, there's lots of different opinions and lots of different noise in the environment on social media and things and where people are learning about topics. But then when you throw in, it's a living sentient being, you get all kinds of uh, differing viewpoints. 
And I think that's something we have to be aware of because if, if we come in with our own viewpoint of saying, all right, we gotta, you gotta do it this way, this way, and this is how I want you to work with the dog, that doesn't take into account the client's viewpoint. And uh, that actually is, it's, it can be detrimental to not only the client, but also the animal. So, um, and I think that's universal for all businesses. I think we always have to kind of come from a place of view, of, especially in a helping type of profession, right? Yeah, and it's a really interesting, um, you know, balance of responsibilities. Because of course, people hire you to save the dog and to help them with the dog, but then you might have to weigh what's going on and say, well, actually, I have to protect the owner here or the people in this situation too, because of you know what you do. Absolutely, and, and society, right? So that I've had clients that their dog is very dangerous, and we have to think about. You know, a good question to ask is would I want this dog living next to me, mm-hmm. right? With my kids, with my dog, with my family, you know, that's, that's a good question. And if the answer is no, we should be considering our, as trainers, you know, is it ethical to say this client is going to be able to handle a dog like a professional trainer, right? So it's uh, lots of considerations when it comes to aggression. So I have a uh, TikTok and of course I get a lot of dog content. <laughs> it's almost like who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so cute. Yeah. And they're, they have these like influencers and things that like mm-hmm. brag about how great they are with aggressive dogs mm-hmm. and they make it seem like any dog, they just need the right, I don't know what, um, trainer or, you know, um, assertive way with them and they'll immediately calm down and be good. And I imagine that's mm-hmm. true in some cases, but it sounds like you're saying that it's absolutely like not all dogs, um, are that easily, you know, um, trained to be safe again. Correct. I mean, it's, it's, unfortunately that's the, especially TikTok, <laughs> social media, <laughs> right? Wow. Uh, well, that's not real. <laughs> yeah. People like the flashy stuff and, uh, gets more views and more likes. And then, you know, it's, it's, and it's easy to edit that kind of stuff too. It's very easy to just, you know, show a dog barking, lunging, growling, and then take a picture of the dog sleeping. It just happens, you know, dogs have to sleep once in a while. Look, like I solved it, you know. And uh, that's the sensationalist side of social media. But it's also, unfortunately, that's the issue with punishment. You know, punishment works really well at first in many cases, but it doesn't solve the long-term problem of really changing how that dog feels about what's going on. So I can, you can stop anybody from doing anything if there's enough punishment or restraints, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if I'm holding a gun to somebody's head, they're probably going to stop doing whatever they were just doing. And then um, that's, but obviously it's not going to make you feel better about holding that gun to your head, right? So that's what we see on TikTok, unfortunately, a lot. There's a lot of good trainers, though. So they just how, need more more attention. How do you deal with that client interaction when the outcome is a lot different than what they had imagined when they hired you? You know, they wanted this, like, turn their, you know, angry beast into a cuddly, you know, yeah. uh, mate. And instead, you're like, well, like, these are the things you would have to do to safely have this dog at home and in your neighborhood. And, you know, he's, yeah. he's never going yeah. to, like you know, be safe around children or X, Y, Z, um, you know, sort of give them the rules for owning this dog. Um, and it's like, how do you just, how do you navigate that conversation? That's, that's a really great question because, um, I think it's important again for all professions, especially helping professions. So not just dog training, but to set expectations right from the start. So your very first conversation or first time meeting that client, you know, you want to build rapport and trust with the client first, but during that first session, you should be setting expectations about what to expect in the future. So that way you don't have to have those uh, difficult conversations later on. Because if you go in with one viewpoint saying, all right, I know this dog in my mind is going to be like this in three or four sessions or three or four months or whatever it is. And the client has another mindset of, oh, my to- dog's totally made great because I have this trainer now. That's going to be a problem three months down the line if things are differently. So I always, my first session, always discuss, you know, this is what we can probably expect. You know, if, and again, if you look at it in the professional personal trainer, you know, if somebody's thinking, oh, I'm going to be in the gym, I'm going to lose 100 pounds this week. That's an unrealistic <laughs> expectation, right? And so if the personal trainer sets the expectations, oh, you're going to do great. Let's just, let's just kind of think about what's going to happen over the next few months and what you might expect depending on the work you put in and all of those other variables like your diet. And same thing for dog training. We have to set expectations. So that way I, I don't ever have to have those conversations later on. And then if I do, it's just a subtle reminder. Be like, hey, remember we talked about it? This is where we're at now. This is what we did, talked about three months ago. And kind of we're assessing. And look, this is 
almost kind of what we talked about. So I find that that's the best way to avoid having to have those conversations later on, because uh, especially with behavior. It's, yeah, it's, they, they it's call that like a, a session zero in some industries where, mm. you know, you just, you know, session zero is about not doing any actual work on, you know, personal training or dog training or, mm. you know, skincare or whatever it is you do. Uh, but it's all about setting expectations and what it will yeah. be. Do you do session zeros or um, just handle it at the beginning of your first it's, session? I would say it's session zero and one at the same time. If that yeah, okay. So I, we, I always want to leave the client with some tangible thing to do so they feel like, all right, now I've got something to start working on uh, in a, uh, as well as an understanding of what's happening with their dog. So uh, in terms of your sort of career growth, uh, what, how long did it take you to get to the point where – um, you know, you're launching a podcast, you're mm -hmm. teaching other trainers, you're, you're hosting, um, you know, uh, events, you know, where people talk about aggression cases. Like, how did you carve out this niche and sort of take it to the next level? Yeah. It's, um, so I've been training for about 20 years and then oh, wow. it's only happened in the last about eight years or so. My first, um, I was always just working with clients and so, um, not just, but you know, I was working with clients <laughs> as my main focus, um, for about 12 years. And then I was invited to start speaking. So I, cause I start, people started knowing I was in the aggression space working with these dogs. So my first talk was at this conference and I gave a talk about staying safe in aggression cases for trainers. And that started to blossom into other things. So once you start doing that, somebody else is like, oh, that was great. They'll come talk here and then come talk there. And then it ends up just, you know, one thing leads to the next, right? So more talks, more workshops, more seminars, more, you know, appearances, podcasts weren't even much around seven, eight years ago. So, um, but you know, you start entering other spaces, you know, you get on social media, you get on TV interviews, radio magazines, that kind of stuff. And I find that it just it continues to accelerate because the word gets out I, yeah. and, um, without really much effort. Sometimes, um, it's interesting how it works, at least in a niche space. That's the thing. And so right. niche is important for, to, I think to accelerate growth because, I think it takes longer to, let's say you want to be the best dog trainer in the world. Okay, that's a good goal, but what is going to get you there? What's going to get you recognized? That's It's much more difficult to do it in that macro space versus if we focus on a micro lane in that environment. So if you want to be the best you know, in a particular type of training, personal training, or you want to be the best type of this particular aspect of skincare. So that's all I did in the dog training space. I like, there's some people talking about aggression, but not enough. So let me, let me focus on that because I love it. I love helping the dogs. And I started uh, focusing on that niche, which led to, you know, all the things I was talking about. And, and I launched the podcast a few years ago and started conferences. So, um, and I shifted to just working with trainers now. So my, my client base technically is all dog trainers and dog professionals at this point. I do take a case from time to time to stay fresh. So I don't, of course, you know, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, it's and it's kind of uh, moved into that space. And I see it in other industries. You see it in, in plenty of other spaces where people that, for instance, again, personal trainers, they've done it for a long time and then they start to train other trainers and then that's what they get known for. And they're just creating content. And that's their business model is creating content, training other trainers, selling courses sometimes or doing seminars. So uh, it's a great, great space to be in because um, you can help so many people that way. I, I find that it's you just can reach out globally versus, uh, you know, having to try to do it in, in individual units. Right, because right. you saw 20 years ago when you started this, there was a lot of need for trainers who were willing to take on aggression cases because mm -hmm. I know some of them won't. Um, and now you're helping more trainers, you know, in more neighborhoods around the world be in that position. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, and the other note too, there is that people, not everybody has to take aggression cases and that's okay. Yeah. But, but you see it, you see the, um, I see a lot of trainers getting into that space. Like I'm just going to focus on aggression cases. And I love that because you just get better at it when you focus on one area. Right. Um, and then some people do agility or some people do nose work and some people focus on, and that's, that's awesome. It's kind of like seeing like the med, like how the medical profession has all kinds of specialists. So we're seeing, we're kind of seeing the same thing in the dog training space. And, um, I always recommend people find a niche if you, if you really want to grow your brand, because then you get known for that particular, you know, whatever you're focusing on. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like I'm, I'm feeling like, you know, you might be fantastic with dogs, uh, but there's some things that aren't necessarily, even if you're great 
as a regular dog trainer that aren't intuitive about aggression cases that you might just need to do a course or learn about. Is that correct? Yeah. So if I understand that correctly, like, um, you do, do you mean, or maybe you should, like, maybe if you can clarify that. What I mean is, um, like there's some really specific skills you're going to want to have if you take mm-hmm. on an aggression case that your sort of overall understanding of dogs might not apply in that dangerous Got instance, yeah. you know, yeah. and you don't get a second chance. <laughs> not definitely. To get yeah, definitely. I mean, the stakes are much higher, of course, in aggression cases. So um, you, you have to be careful because there's a lot of liability. There's a lot of risk potential. Um, and you're also you know, the, the potential outcomes for the dog can be, you know, permanent, right? So euthanasia and uh, the unfortunate outcomes for some dogs. So it's, I think it's very important ethically to, before you take aggression cases, you really should have a good foundation of knowledge and a lot of things, but also have done some work learning about how to work with aggression cases before diving into them because it's there's the ramifications are much different than if like i'm doing puppy classes right and there's nothing wrong with doing puppy classes i, I encourage that highly because then you reduce the number of aggressive dogs out there yeah of but course. uh but it's a different space and with different ra- potential ramifications so what's it like training other trainers do you feel, find that people are it's really easy if people want to know what you know do you find that people already like think they know everything and you have to like slow them down what uh what is that experience like or is it i, lo- I love it i love it um i've had uh, i've got about t- close to 1200 students that have come through my course and i think i last count have lectured to around fifteen thousand trainers over the years so it's been uh, i love it i mean it's just so great to see that um everybody's anybody who's coming is obviously opening to learning because that's why they went to the course or um you know went to a conference and so i haven't had uh, you know really much negative experience with it i i I really enjoy teaching i really enjoy meeting people um and it's just i I love helping the industry i love helping the community love helping the dogs so it's just been win 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 in every aspect for me um i don't you know on occasion you know you have some trainers that are struggling in their own businesses or their own life or dealing with, you know, some toxicity that could be happening between trainers. And, um, so that can, those can be difficult moments, but again, the, if you go back to the purpose of just helping others, that's, that makes it all worthwhile. So, uh, wouldn't change a thing. Stay focused on that. Can you actually paint me a picture of, you know, what it's like, to be in one of your classes learning about aggression cases? Are they usually group trainings? Do you do one-on-one? How does, yeah. how do you yeah, get so started? I've, how does it happen? I have a few different um, avenues for education. So uh, I started with the workshop aspect. So you go to a location, you know, you might see 50 to a hundred trainers show up and you, sh- you teach them the techniques, you know, you show them presentations of cases and things like that. Do you have to find them like an aggressive dog to bring to this workshop? <laughs> Uh, no, no. So okay. most of the time dogs are not allowed because obviously there's okay. safety risks. Sometimes right, I do right. classes with dogs, uh, but with it, when it's a trainer focused type of seminar, yeah, we're just kind of learning. We do okay. practice so with like things video like, cases where you yeah. show what's happening, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And we practice things like leash skills and we do some breakouts. So it's not just sitting there for two days or three days right. sitting in front of a screen, but uh, yeah. And then, then of course you have conferences um, that people get together at and it's kind of similar format learning from other experts. That's something I've enjoyed as well. It's bringing, you know, collaborating with other experts in the industry. Um, I, th- I think that's a highly valuable thing for any, again, anybody else that's not in the dog training space that might be listening in. I highly recommend networking and collaborating with other professionals, even if it's you at a conference or you hosting the conference itself. It, there's so much value in that for the whole community, as of course, well as well as your brand. So building your business, it's it's very important to do that as well, or can be very um, uh, beneficial for you. So, uh, and then I have my course, which is just, you know, they, people, uh, it's sort of on demand, but then I have mentor sessions, group mentor sessions. So, um, in the course creator space, there's different formats. Sometimes it's just on demand. You watch the modules and you're done. And there's not much interaction with the person that created the course. Uh, and then you have sort of like mine, which is there's a mentor session where you, everybody meets as a group. And then you have full on 
like flagship coaching programs, they call them, where you get tons of time with the instructor. I haven't done that because I haven't had the time to do it. But uh, so there's different options. If anybody's listening that's looking into getting into the course creator space, it's um, there's there's lots of different formats. If anybody's thinking about jumping into that, yeah, it's such an important topic. I think in dog training and other such industries that book clients, because of course people are working for themselves, but to really um, have the kind of rewarding career that you have, most people do need mentorship or these kinds of things. So I was wondering, what's your advice about finding mentors in your industry? Is it really about going to these kinds of conferences or courses, yep. meeting people? Just how did you do it? And what would you recommend to any dog trainers starting out who are looking for that more connected experience? Yeah, it's it. We got to get back in person. Number one, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's the whole thing thing that's been missing over the last few years is that it's very difficult to make those connections you're talking about the relationships without seeing people face to face. You can kind of do it online, but there's just so much noise in the environment, and and it's hard to, to kind of really get a feel for how somebody is through just a post, right? Or, you know, some, some meme that they post, you know, it's very difficult. So, um, I found most of my mentors early on just, you know, going to those conferences and networking and meeting people in person and be like, Hey, you know, you mind if I, you know, buy your beer and buy a cup of coffee or something, you mind if we sit down and then ask if they have the time for, for that kind of mentor. And it can be formal. It can be like a full blown, like, all right, I'm taking you under my wing for a year, two years, whatever. Or it could be just, I just want to bounce emails off you once in a while. Is that okay? And, and that's okay too. That could be a mentorship. So, um, I, you know, which I kind did you have? Yeah. All of the above. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have had a lot of kind people over the years. I mean, I, I mean, there's a lot, been so many gracious people that have been so helpful in my journey, and I, that's that's a beautiful thing, right? Because I I want to do the same. I want to extend the same sort of open um, approach to. Hey, if you want to learn, I'm willing to teach. You know, just be nice. <laughs> that's it. That's that's my only rule. Just be nice, and then you know, I'll teach you whatever you want to learn. Uh, I think that's that's an important aspect of any uh, mentorship. So, and then finding a good match, of course, you got to find a mentor that's sort of meets your ideals, matches your ideals in some ways. Um, and that has the time to do it. That's another thing we have to do. We have to respect the time of others as well. Right. Yeah. And, and probably is interested in the same sort of career path as you, Yeah, like you're looking for people who want to pick up this, you know, mission mm -hmm. of helping, you know, these aggression cases. Definitely. Definitely. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, you can learn things too from depends, you know, I've had business mentors as well. I hired somebody a few years back, um, in more of a professional capacity, but super helpful for my, and I, I mean, that's, that's one thing we miss too, right. As, as like dog trainers, personal trainers, or, you know, any industry, we don't, I don't think any of us spend enough investing in ourselves on the business marketing side of things, mm -hmm. right? Because when you're so focused on like training dogs or skincare, or personal training, you, you don't have a lot of time to learn about things like SEO or social media ads and things like that. So we need to spend some time investing in, into ourselves in that aspect as well to be really successful entrepreneurs, I think. So I did some of that as well. Yeah. Yeah. How did you find it, by the way? That's my world, marketing and communications. <laughs> um, somebody, at the, this particular person actually reached out to me after seeing my social media presence. So uh -huh. he's kind of more, uh, he's very good about not making it salesy though. Cause you get right. a lot of those, you know, cold call, like or emails and things like that. But this person was genuine, took the time. That's a huge thing. Like somebody that takes their time to understand your space and be like, you know, I see what you're doing and this is what I do. And that's the big difference. That's what sold me because this person took the time to learn about me before making like that cold call. And that's, I was like, this is the guy for me and amazing, like really, really yeah. helpful. Yeah. yeah. No, that's exactly what you do is you, you know, you can't do everything and everyone has limited hours in a day. So you mm -hmm. find someone who understands your mission and knows mm -hmm that piece of the puzzle and that you can work with and communicate well with. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, and, uh, you know, what have you learned as you've sort of grown your brand as far as important things to think about, you know, either finding someone or learning about yourself? You know, it's interesting. That's a great question, especially for this week. Um, as I've grown my brand, uh, you've become aware of new things as you grow in terms of your public image and um, how you have to be careful with certain words that you use because 
you can't assume everybody knows what you're talking about or what you're going through at a certain time. So you do have to be careful with your messaging because you you go from, you know, you might have a hundred followers to thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. And when you get to certain t- levels, you have, you at first nobody's noticing. And then at some, at one point people start noticing, but you're not really getting criticized. Everybody's sort of on your team. But then when you get to a certain level, it doesn't matter what you say. <laughs> you're going to have people that get upset or critique what you say. And it's hard at first not to take it personally, but you realize that, okay, I guess it's a good thing. Maybe I've grown enough to, to, um, be one of those people that well, right, you're going to get negative commentary. So it's a nice sort of uh, reinforcer at the same time. But I, I, you also kind of have to set up boundaries for yourself. So any of the influencers that might be listening in now probably have seen or gone through the same thing. And I think one of the things that's important is to say, okay, I can't take this personally. It's just where I'm at in my journey. Um, and you know, it's, it's, I have to be careful not to just snipe back, right? I can be like, Oh, you're, you don't know what you're talking about because everybody else is going to see that. And that's not the persona I want to, yeah, I yeah, want to put yeah. out there, you know, it should be kindness all the time. And, and that's, that's really important to me. There's always someone who's going to try to troll you online, especially once you get to a certain stature. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. Especially when it's in a space that has a lot of emotions involved too. Yeah, so you can't, you can't yeah. stop your day because someone's wrong on the internet. That's <laughs> exactly, and that's at every level, right? We can't, you know, yeah. it's hard not to, but uh, it's a good uh, practice to put in place. Yeah. Well, just going back down to you know the mission and the kindness. If there's one thing you want the whole world to know about um, aggression cases with dogs, mm-hmm. what would that be? Mm. both people and dogs are often going through something in their life that you might not be aware of so first before you respond to the dog snarling and lunging at you in a negative way because it's offensive when we see that or a person getting upset with you in an offensive way um, first come from a place of why would this person or dog be going through that is there something they they experienced that day or previously in their life or trauma and um and they are just not able to communicate that to me right now because I haven't created a safe space for them. So create that safety first, come from a place of kindness, and then um, you'll often see a miraculous change in both dogs and people. So that's what I've learned, um, and that's what I'm going to continue carrying forth because it, it works. It really does, for me at least. Wow. Um, those sound, those are some wise words. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, also, I wanted to include a, a plug zone uh, for any, how can people find you? Do you have any events coming up? Um, any things people should go check out? Um, I know you have a podcast. Yeah. So the, the easiest way to find me is aggressivedog.com. So not dogs, it's just aggressivedogsingular.com. And we'll um, share that link in the show notes. So look for I it there. I appreciate that. And then uh, the podcast I've got, I'm doing recordings um, in next month, but the podcast for this season will be launching in June uh, of 2023. So it's the bitey end of the dog. If you're interested in just dog behavior in general, I love to talk, chat up with other guests. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got the conference coming up in October, so late September, early October in Chicago. It's the Aggression and Dogs Conference. So I'm excited for that. And uh, this year is exciting. I finally get to travel a lot again. So I'm actually just uh next month heading off to five different countries and doing a little bit of a mini world tour for a few months and then and then got a couple months off for the summer and then back to traveling all over again so exciting exciting plans for this year fantastic well thank you so much for joining us mike and for everyone for joining us on booked solid best way to support the podcast is to you know do some bookings and run a business on pocket suite uh and following that to leave us a review on your podcasting service of choice Uh, we're also on youtube so thank you for coming and look out for more episodes soon